Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the EPS Fleet Development Corporation Planning Committee. Uh, we're going to start with introductions. My name is Neil Cameron. Uh, I'm the chair of this committee, and I'm a non-executive director of development. And I'm going to turn to the vice chair. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Valerie Owen. I'm vice chair of the planning committee, but also non-exec director on the board of EPSP UDC. And we have two members of the committee online. So, Fred, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Fred Maroudas, uh, non-executive director of Ebsfleet Development Corporation and member of the planning committee. And David? Hello there, I'm Councillor David Moat uh, from Dartford Borough Council, Cabinet Portfolio for Housing. And Lee? Um, yeah, apologies for absence or lateness. Uh, Lee Croxton, Gracian Borough Council, Chair of the planning committee. Right, we will go to the uh, first item, which is apologies for absence, and we've received apologies from the Reverend Penny Marsh, who's a member of the committee. Um, no other apologies. No. Uh, next, declarations of interest. Um, and in an abundance of caution, I'm going to make some declarations, which I think are not declarations that technically of interest, but in my work as a planning barrister, I have worked to get in the past, I have worked with and been instructed by Kieran Rush, who is the planner for the applicant. And I've also worked with and been instructed by three solicitors and the two individuals who are named in the objector letter. Both those uh, relate to the Ebsfleet Central East planning application. Um, any other declarations of interest? Uh, no. no. Thank you. Urgent items. Any urgent items? No, Chair. We now have the record of our meeting that was held on the 8th of May 2024. And we're, I'm certainly grateful for these um, comprehensive minutes. Any uh, matters arising or comments on the minutes? Uh, can we adopt those minutes as a correct record of the meeting? Great. Yeah. Thank you. Right, we're now on to item five, which is Ebsfleet Central East planning application. And I'm going to outline the procedure we're going to follow for this application. But just um, so that everybody is aware, there are handling arrangements that have been adopted for this application and they are published on the corporation's website. And by handling arrangements, I mean uh, administrative arrangements to ensure that there's a separation between the functions of the development corporation as applicant and the development corporation as local planning authority. Now, everybody will be aware of the terms of reference for this committee and section five, which sets out the procedure that we follow, subject to the discretion of the chair. And we're going to follow the procedure, which will be the normal procedure. So, first of all, officer presentation. Slight change to that. Um, we're going to allow Michael Jessup up to 15 minutes presentation. There will then be an opportunity for objectors to have uh, five minutes in total. So if you've got a number of different speakers, um, the combined total is five minutes, but you may just have one person. Up to you. Um, uh, we have one uh, objector registered to speak, and that is Kenex. And that is uh, Mr. Gordon Pratt. We also had an objection registered from Sky Crook, but I've been told that they no longer wish to appear. So that means that Canex have got the whole the five minutes for objectors. Uh, and as you would have seen from the terms of reference, 
uh, we'll let you speak for your five minutes. And then if there are any points of clarification, um, committee members can ask questions uh, generally through the chair, but we will see how that goes. We then get uh, supporters. They have five minutes in total and same procedure. And after that, the committee will uh, debate the application and discuss it and form a view on it. So that's the procedure. So I'm going to hand over to you, Michael, okay. as I've left anything out. And Mark, I'll tell me. Thank you, everyone. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, OK, so yeah, I introduced the, the application for Epsilon Central East. So it's a site to the east of the Epsilon International Railway Station. The proposal is an outline planning application with all matters reserved for mixed use development comprising demolition of these existing car parking, structures of station forecourt, and provision of residential dwellings, flexible, flexible commercial business and service uses, um, flexible learning and non residential institutions, local community uses, hotel use, residential institutions, and various sui gener generous uses as well. Um, I'm, not, I'm not reading the full description, but associated works include hard soft landscaping, a river park, car parking, including multi story car parks, pedestrian cycle, and road networks within the sites, and associated crossings, highway accesses, and junction improvements. And it's an application that's been made by the Epsilon Development Corporation. Before I move on, I'll just draw members' attention to a supplementary report that was circulated earlier today, provides a few clarifications and minor amendments to the main reports. And also, there was a late representation received on behalf of Tarmac, which I'll address later in the presentation. Oh, there are hard copies and electronic copies for those on, on screen. So members will be familiar with this image on, on, on screen, which is an extract from the Epsilon implementation framework, showing the major development sites in Epsilon. It's included to show the context of Epsilon Central at the heart of Epsilon, which is in, in the middle here. Well, I think my cursor is not quite aligned, but you know the site here. The next slide zooms in a little bit in terms of the wider Epsilon Central context. So um, quite a busy slide, but I'll, I'll talk through a few bits. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, um, it's, it's quite dominated by, by, road, by road and rail. So the, the high speed one railway line run, runs from north north to south. So I'm just trying to line my cursor because it doesn't type with what's on my screen. But from north to south is high, it's the high speed one railway line. Bisecting the site is the North Kent line spur that connects the highway, um, the HS1 line to the North Kent line that runs to the north of the site. The site itself includes a lot of st station car parking. So car parks A, B and C are within the application sites. And to the west is car park D. Um, road network wise, we've got Thames Way that runs around the north of the site linking into Epsley Gateway that runs to the sort of east and south, linking to the roundabout at the bottom of the slides. Um, the River Epsley runs through the heart of the scheme, so the, the green areas, as you can see here, again, sorry, the cursor's not really working, but you can see where the, where the landscape corridor is. The River Epsley runs from Springhead in the south through the sites, and it ends up here, the River, River Thames to the north. That area is all designated as the local wildlife sites. Um, in ecological terms, we've also got the, um, the Swanscombe Peninsula site of special scientific interest to the west, which is the majority of the land to the west of the high speed line, and then Blue Lake to the east of the sites. Surrounding communities include Norfleet to, to the north and east, and there's an annotation showing Norfleet High Street and also the Hill Conservation Area in Norfleet, which includes two listed churches. To the south, Springhead Park, and then to the west, is Castle Hill and Epsley Green, and further west and north is Swanscombe. Another point of note to the south of Blue Lake is the Northfleet Wastewater Treatment Works. These three images show the application site. So the, the left image is the red line boundary. The site is a bit hard to, to, to make out, but it's essentially the land to the east of the high speed one line. There's some red line, red line lands to the west, which is primarily the road access international way and, and Epsley Gateway linking to that to the roundabout. There's also a small section to the west that provides a link between International Way and South Fleet Road for part of the developments. The middle slide shows the application site split between two principal phases. So EC1 is the area in, in blue and EC2 is the area in green. And this is most applicable when we're looking at planning conditions that talk about the phasing of the sites. And then the image to the right shows the local authority boundary 
between Dartford and Croatian, which, which roughly runs along the line of, of the river, the River Emsleet, but it shows that site is within both, both local authority areas. So therefore, applicability here is that both Dartford and Croatian local plan policies apply. The next two slides show some aerial photos, which I think are really helpful in terms of in, giving an indication of the size of the sites. But also, it's sort of useful to show the kind of almost a contrast between the infrastructure, the car parks, the rail, the road, and then the undeveloped area in terms of the river corridor. I think that the, the ecological elements of side of the site you don't really see from maybe just passing the site on road or rail. So I think this image, the bigger image here, is particularly helpful in terms of understanding that that sort of mix between infrastructure and and, and ecology as well. This slide shows a few more a few more images. I think this probably shows a bit more dominant um, infrastructure. The car parks to the um, on the left image in the top right. An image on the bottom right is the unfinished bridge plaza, which is the unconnected bridge that spans the HS1 line to the south of the application sites. Okay, so this applicate this this slide sort of talking for a little bit about the the application as a process. So it's an outline application, as I say, with all matters reserved. So essentially, it's seeking approval for the principal developments. If approved, it would establish the planning framework for development of the site going forwards. That that main sort of sort of the main spine of documents being submitted for approval comprise the development specification, which establishes a mix and range of different uses proposed for the sites. The parameter plans, which are a series of plans that set the sort of the design parameters for the for the sites. This includes development zones, i.e., the areas you can and can't build, uh, proposed site levels, distribution of land uses, location of active frontages maximum building heights, landscape and public realm, and access and circulation. The highway plans show proposed physical highway works, including junction improvements and new access points to the sites. Just to reiterate, as an outline application, this isn't granting planning permission for any development itself. Reserve matters of approvals will be required before any development could commence on sites. A few points of note here is EIA development. So the application was accompanied by an environmental statement to assess various, to, to assess various environmental impacts, including socioeconomics, flood risk, heritage, ecology, transport, and landscape. There was statutory and non-statutory <coughs> consultation undertaken through the process, including a, a period of reconsultation. The application was advertised as a departure from the development plan, and we received 11 local representations. As a quick summary at the end, the principal development does fully accord with adopted Gratian local plan and Dartford local plan policy and the implementation framework. I could pick up queries on the departure point if needed, but they're fairly minor points. In, in short, the application is in compliance with policy. Turning to some of the detail of the application itself now, this slide shows um, some of the proposed or the proposed uses. So comprising up to 485,000 square metres of floor space, the proposed development seeks to provide the heart of Ebsleet, comprising a, a dynamic urban centre with commercial, leisure and retail uses supported by homes, community and cultural facilities, including healthcare, education and associated infrastructure. The table on the left is taken from the development specification. It includes a few bits of text in red where proposed planning conditions look to slightly tweak the minimum floor, floor spaces being proposed. So just running through a few details here. And um, residential terms, the illustrative master plan is, is assuming 2,100 homes, but the actual outline is proposing between 1,000 and 2,000 homes, 2,500 homes, very roughly. Of all the homes delivered, at least 35% would be affordable. And through the recommended planning conditions, a housing diversification strategy is recommended to seek to ensure a mix of tenure and type of different housing products through the sites. In terms of business use, the application is proposing up to 110,000 square metres of, of business floor space, so office type uses. Um, there's a business hub proposed in the centre of, of EC2. The, the, the parameter plans that are shown in the top corner show the colours, I'm not sure how clear they are, but they sort of show the broad distribution of some of the uses. The purple is any permitted use, so it shows they're very flexible, but certain uses like the, the, the blue on the right hand image shows that core area for, for employment use. And as you can see on the image on the left, table on the left, 30,000 square metres is the is the inflated minimum that the LPA are recommending for employment uses. The, the development specification proposes 20,000, but as explained in the report, we feel slightly higher up if it's required. So we're proposing that. In terms of retail, we are securing, seeking to secure a minimum floor space for retail to make sure that it meets the needs of the development in terms of providing a local centre and a district centre as required by planning policy. 
Turning to healthcare, there's been lots of discussion with the NHS and the application is committing to a permanent primary um, healthcare facility of around about 1,000 square metres to be delivered on site by around about 300 occupation. That's been agreed with the NHS. And similarly with KCC, the need for a primary school has been agreed and will be delivered as part of the development by the 1,000th occupation. In conclusion on mix of uses, the, the mix and quantum accords with policy expectations and would support creation of an active and vibrant new community. As I noted, planning conditions impose triggers to ensure timely delivery alongside residential. This slide talks about landscape, open space and ecology. And on the left is the landscape and public <laughs> practice plan. This includes commit commitments such as 30% open space on, within sites. It talks about the different types of, of, of open space that will be provided. So the green area shows ecologically enhanced areas to be enhanced. The orange area show public realm, key public realm routes. And there are some asterisks on site that show the key public spaces. This is a landscape and open space strategy recommended through a condition to establish the sort of the approach to delivery of these complementary spaces, particularly noting the, the need to ensure spaces work for people as well as nature. Just turning briefly to ecology, the image on the right shows a triple SI, but this flags the, the, the key designations for ecology in terms of some European sites yeah. to the northeast site, around about six kilometres away. The triple site and then the Epsley Marshes local wildlife site that is within the site boundary itself. Just on ecology, through the years, any impacts can be suitably mitigated through funding conditions. The site also, I think, offers an opportunity to enhance, enhance ecology as well as mitigate it. And the applicant has committed to a voluntary 10% target for biodiversity net gain. This might not be a, a mandatory requirement. Just on design, the image on the left is the indicative master plan. So this shows one way in which the development could come forward. Um, it's not for approval, but it, it shows how it could, and it has been assessed by, by the LPA's design team, and it scores really well under the Building for Healthy Life assessment. It scores 12, 12 green, so that's not binding, but it kind of sets hopefully a positive benchmark for future de detailed design schemes as and when they, they come forward. The image in the middle is the indicative master plan showing story heights, so there is a there is a, um, a parameter plan for maximum heights, but it's a bit hard to read in terms of it just deals with heights rather than story numbers. So this gives a little bit of a flavour for the, for the anticipated sort of scale of development in terms of heights, and it ranges between five, six, seven storeys generally to up to over 10 storeys, maybe up to 14 in, in, in parts as well. And the area master plans that we'll talk about in a minute will um, guide the form and the scale of that of those buildings. Um, it also talked about minimum minimum heights. I think as well as establishing maximums, minimums are quite quite important to ensure the quantum of development as well as the enclosure of space and the surveillance over the spaces. So, the uh, as per the bullets at the top, in terms of design going forward, area master plans and area design codes are proposed to kind of form that framework for the next stage, and that they in turn will inform um, assessment of detailed reserve matters as and when they come forward in the future. Transport access and movement slide. So the premise plan on the left is, is obviously a, is a, is a key slide. Good access and movement is, is essential to make the development work, particularly because of its central location, both, both in terms of the new community on site, but also connections to the existing communities. The parameter plan identifies movement routes through the site, including roads, paths, cycle routes, as well as um, it particularly identifies four bridges over the river in EC in EC1, so you can't really see them on here, but there's a commitment to ensuring that river isn't a barrier to accessibility, which I think is really, really important. And this also identifies locations for um, station facilities, drop off, taxi rank, disabled parking, bus stops, etc. as well. Um, the middle slide doesn't show much because it's quite a high level, but it's intended to kind of identify there are a number of physical highway works proposed to provide access, improved access, improved highway capacity to serve the development. I think a key point of note is a fast track route is proposed to run through the site, providing a direct connection between South Fleet Road and Thames Way. Just in terms of wider connectivity, some offsite um, public right way improvements are proposed through contributions to KCC, um, and the scheme also um, safeguards the delivery of more strategic links to North Fleet and to Swanscombe via North Fleet Station and also the unfinished Bridge Plaza. There's reference to some planning obligations, which I think are a key. There's a substantial package to securing mitigation, but also incentives to, in, to improve access and to incentivise active travel. So again, avoid car car use, various things like car clubs and sustainable travel funds to offer maybe bus vouchers to local residents is proposed. Just one point to pick up in terms of the tarmac rep and the letter that's been circulated. 
And this concern stems from trip generation figures used by the applicant in respect to operations at the tarmac sites, utilising the existing access points via the roundabout onto Thames Way. This roundabout is proposed to be changed to a signal control junction, which I think is the root of the objection. As set out in paragraph 7, 12, 13 and 7, 12, 14 of the main report, the trip generation figures used were taken from the transport assessment provided on behalf of Tarmac when they applied for planning permission for their sites. Despite dating back to 2009, the trip, genera trip generation figures for that proposed development have been accepted by KCC and National Highways and were used by Tarmac when varying, varying their planning permissions more recently in 2019. The applicants not agreed to undertake additional modelling based on the trip generation figures proposed by Tarmac and neither did the LPA consider it necessary to require this. So based on advice from KCC highways and national, national highways, the, uh, the LPA are content that information in the applicant's TA and environmental statements is adequate for the purpose of determining this application. Just moving on briefly because I'm mindful of time. Um, in terms of other considerations, just picking up some things mentioned in the report, amenity, flood risk, heritage and archaeology, um, strategy around energy and sustainability, and also a strategy for formal sport and recreation of features of um, conditions that are proposed through the recommendation con recommended conditions in Appendix 1. I can come back to some, some images to, through discussion if needed, but um, this obviously it, it kind of almost starts to kind of illustrate how the scheme could work. I think it's really useful to give an indication for the public spaces, the landscaping, scale of the buildings, as well as sort of that, that sort of desire for activity and vibrancy as, as, as the place. So we can come back to these if members like, but they're, they're hopefully helpful slides to show a bit of the vision for what the site proposed by the applicants. My penultimate slide before I finish is um, I just wanted to briefly talk through the, the recommended structure of an outline planning permission if, if, if it's granted. So um, this slide shows, and it's included in the appendix. So at the moment, we're in, in the, at the top level. We're at the outline planning permission stage where we're looking at the um, development specification, parameter plans, highway plans, the planning conditions that go along to guide it alongside the planning obligations as well. So they're all set out in the reports. Following that, if outline planning permission is, is, is granted under, in the terms proposed, next stage would be looking at site-wide strategies. That would feed down into area master plans and area design codes before we're then looking at detailed reserve matters for but for each individual subphase of development as it comes forward. So just a point of note here that there has been an acceptance of advanced infrastructure. So certain things like some, some key roads, maybe the fast track link to Southley Road could come forward in advance of detailed master planning to help aid with delivery. Um, but they would still need to undertake things like archaeological investigation before any development happens on site. And then this flows down into discharge condition phase and then commencement on site. So just in summary, the application presents an exciting opportunity to realise a long established aspiration for development of these sites in accordance with national and local policies and the implementation framework. So subject to planning conditions and obligations, it's recommended for approval as set out in the, as amended in the supplementary report and as shown on screen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, just before we turn to um, Kenex, uh, can I just ask you a couple of questions? Um, we've had the letter sent by uh, free solicitors on behalf of Tarmac. We can confirm that it's been passed to all members of the planning committee. And I'd just like to ask you on that. You've told us um, that it's your view that the environmental information is adequate. Um, so you've answered first question I was going to ask you. Next one, um, does it, does the information provide adequate uh, information to describe and to assess the likely significant effects of the development proposed? So that's on the traffic impact point particularly, but it's an overall question. Yeah, I mean, as an answer to the overall question, it's been independently assessed. The environmental statement assessed on the LPA's behalf and it, and it demonstrated it does provide the information. So we're satisfied generally. On the specific transport points, um, yeah, I and mean, we've, we've looked at the, the, the scoping opinion picked up committee development, identified committee developments that did in, in, include the two, um, the two planning commissions for Tarmac. One, they've both been implemented and that used the transport data that was avail available to them. So, um, 
the, the EIA scoping opinion that was adopted did include the information, the planning commissions that were linked to those to that data. Um, there was extensive discussions between the applicants, transport consultant team, KCC Highways and National Highways, both at pre-application stage and post-submission in terms of the transport modelling, the data, the trip generation rates as well. So um, I think we feel they've been robustly kind of scrutinised by, by all parties. So um, I think in short, yeah, we are satisfied that we have got the right information, adequate information that suitably describes the, the likely significant effects. Yes. And have you considered whether to make a request under Regulation 25 of the Environmental Impact Assessment Regulations, which allows a local authority to request further information if they think the information is inadequate. Has that been considered? Yes, when we had the, the environmental statement independently assessed, that was one of the considerations. And there was various clarifications coming from that, that assessment, but nothing that requires the, the formal request for further information. So yes, we have considered that, but we didn't feel that necessary. Thank you very much. Um, right, let's turn to Canex. So if you'd like to come up to the table. And um, I suppose it's Pratt, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yes. Well, welcome. Nice to see you. Um, people who've been here before will tell you that I'm a bit of a stickler for time, but you've got your five minutes. The right. floor is yours. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. And for the afternoon. Um, I'm here today, uh, my name is Gordon Pratt, I'm the Managing Director of the Thames Great White Um I have a brief prepared, it was meant to be less than two minutes, so I think I should be okay for time. Um, we feel that it's important that the national planning policy framework should be followed for this particular application. And I will quote what the national planning policy framework says with regard to transport. I'm reading section nine promoting sustainable transport. Transport issues should be considered from the early stages of planning and development proposals so that A, the potential impacts of development on transport networks can be addressed, and B, opportunities from existing or proposed transport infrastructure and changing transport technology and usage are realised. For example, in relation to the scale, location, or density of development that can be accommodated. Now, we feel that Ed Street Central is an important application. Unfortunately, there are two significant proposed transport projects which we had difficulty in seeing within, <coughs> sorry, within the application. First, the Ed Street Southern Rail Link, which is promoted by Network Rail and which forms part of the Kent Rail strategy to ensure the economic success of Ebstra. And to quote Network Rail, the aim of the pre-grip study in relation to Shedford Southern Rail is to identify infrastructure requirements to produce a new connection between Swanwick and Ebbs International to provide 12 car services from South London to support predicted passenger uplift demands due to the proposed Ebstra Garden City. And our colleagues at Network Rail well, we are engaged with, <coughs> We are in discussions with them and in terms of the transport um, accesses, that's accessibility to And it's a proposal they have which would reduce journey times to Swanley to 10 minutes, from South 20, and London Victoria 14 minutes from Ebsley Central. Really increasing the public transport access levels for people living at Ebsley uh, Central. You look at it, the high speed train to St Pancras and then down to um, London Victoria is not any quicker than the road rail proposal to run train straight to Ansel Desert International. The second proposal is the Cross River Kennex Tram. The outline business case was submitted to the Department for Transport and reviewed on their behalf by UK Tram, which is the which is the body funded by the government to review light round proposals. As a result, we um, managed to get approval of our, our, our business case. The scheme is now actually being supported by UK Tram with the Department of Transport and is due to be followed up with the new government in line with public announcements and their desire to see new sustainable infrastructure enabling economic activity, growth, and new homes. <clears throat> 
um, and the Cross River Tram proposal would provide a 10 minute journey time to South Essex using reliable sustainable transport. And there is a consultant who is very important at the moment um, who has worked for the Department of Transport, who is currently in the process of preparing a paper for the government to ensure that that transport option is available. So we believe that national planning policy framework should be complied with and that an adequate public transport access level is achieved. And fortunately, in this case, there are two proposed sustainable transport schemes, which are already, all, already partway through their assessment process um, with the government. And we believe that both of those can be leveraged for the benefits of Street Central scheme. Finally, um, just looking at the wider economic assessment, it's key to Epsom Central is within a commutable distance, provided there's adequate public transport of a, of a population excess of 3 million. And Kate Willard, um, the chair of the Central Street Growth Board, mentions that normally when she's giving a presentation. It's very important, we feel, to point out that with these two elements of connectivity, the tramway and the Epsom Southern Railway, it opens up Epsom, it's the economic hub of an area with a population greater than Greater Manchester. I think I've achieved my five minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, are you happy if committee members have got questions to Absolutely. answer them? Um, has anybody got any questions that they'd like to uh, pursue? Um, to, well, I, can I just, while you're here, can I just understand precisely what you're saying? Are you saying that the scheme, because it's an outline scheme, is incompatible with the two transport schemes that you're referred to? Or are you saying that more should have been done to incorporate them? Just trying to understand what your actual objection is. Well, we believe that the any policy framework should have been looked at in terms of what additional benefits these schemes would provide for the uh, line planning here. So our objection is we don't feel that enough attention has been paid to the national plans and policy framework at this stage because it's at this stage, and we we'll go back to the word of the, of the planning policy. Um, the, the potential impacts of development on transport networks should be considered at the earliest stages of plan making. That's what the, that's what the um, framework says. So we feel that it should incorporate this, and in fact, we believe that it may well increase the number of potential new homes, increase the economic activity. So our objection is that hasn't been looked at, even though we feel it should, should have been. Thank you. Anybody else got? Yes, I just, I mean, I said previously, um, do support the idea of a tram scheme, provided it can be adequately funded. You reassure me that there is the funding available for such proposal. Yes, we 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 spoke with a um, uh, business that raises funds, mail and station speed, a station speed data last few days, but have a number of successful fundraisings uh, that uh, they have achieved um, around the country and overseas. Um, it is a case that new transport developments will enhance the value of the land around them and new developments. Funding, especially given the barrier of the River Thames, which effectively cuts off Ebb Street from the population of one and a half to two million and South Essex. Um, there is opportunity there. Um, and we've even seen um, similar fundraising within an urban centre, for example, Sydney, Australia, where the station has enabled this type of high density development in the city centre. The answer to the question is yes. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, David, Councillor David Moon. Hello there. Yeah, um, I'm very aware of the, uh, the Kennex offering because it's been something that's been on the table for quite some time linked originally into the idea of Ebbsfleet and, uh, and the LRCH uh, London Resort. And I'm quite supportive of, of a plan of a, a, a tram system, which would effectively link both sides of the Thames. Um, I, I'm also a little confused in the fact that I couldn't work out whether this was a, opposing the, uh, the plan or just the fact that you want to get involved earlier uh, so you don't miss the opportunity to actually become part of a, a bigger thing. Um, I, it sounds to me very much as if it's the second part of that conversation. I don't think you're opposed to this activity. You just don't want to miss the opportunity to be part of this later on. Or is that me just being a little bit naive? I think that the opposition is that the national planning policy framework, as far as we can see, is not a good part of it. It requires transport to be considered from the early stages. And it's a lot easier to incorporate uh, enhancing schemes such as the tramway or the rail projects at an early stage rather than what you can do after <laughs> there are yeah. situations yeah. we're aware David where things are developed and then right okay now we can be in the trials when you've got a big issue yeah yeah uh, and, and I appreciate how that's worked in uh, in, in Fleet, um with the KCC and the fast track Okay, that's that was that's just enlightened me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unless there's anything more, we'll we'll thank you for your contribution. Thank you. And um, uh, you'd like to go back to where, well, you, you're welcome to stay, and I assume you'd like to. But I'll, if you go there, I'll go we'll back. let the uh, supporters have their turn. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ruth, you've got uh, five minutes. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ruth Bryan, and I'm the head of SP Central and the lead for this project. This outline planning application is the culmination of four years of work by EDC to bring forward SP Central East following the acquisition of the site in 2019. This previously developed brownfield site comprised of 34.86 hectares, has been earmarked for development for a number of years including a now expired consent. At the national level, EDC's direct intervention to deliver FC Central is supported by the Ministry of Homes, Communities and Local Government, who recognise the pivotal role it plays in delivering the heart of the garden city and the full vision for FC. At the local level, the site is identified as a strategic development area in the FC implementation framework and is allocated as a key site within Gravesham and Dartford local plan. This application seeks to deliver a mixed use development of up to 485,000 metres square of floor space and will deliver the heart of the garden city, creating a vibrant, sustainable centre and business hub with high quality, flexible workspace, providing crucial employment in the garden city. The proposals will deliver a substantial number of new well-designed homes, including 35% affordable housing. Retail, leisure, food and beverage will strengthen the new community of workers and residents of a variety and choice for Ebsfleet Central as a, Ebsfleet as a whole. The proposals include the direct delivery of primary school education, healthcare facilities and community buildings to support the new community. We have championed a collaborative approach to the development of the proposals, working closely with the local planning authority, Dartford and Graves and Borough Councils, the Kent County Council and statutory council team. We've engaged proactively with the local community and specifically reached out to local schools and youth groups to take part in the design process. To achieve the scale and nature of development envisaged at FC Central, the proposals include buildings at a range of scales and heights. These have been carefully considered, informed by landscape and townscape assessment to ensure that they respect the character of the area and protect heritage assets. Throughout this outline planning application, you'll see reference to securing flexibility. This is not a dilution of the ambitious vision for FC Central, but establishes a robust framework for EDC and future developers to work within. The parameter plans are submitted for approval and seek to establish the principle and character of development whilst affording flexibility in respect to detailed design. The scale of this project, given the scale of this project, it will come forward over a long period of time and must be able to adapt to future trends 
and demand to secure the maximum benefits from this site. The flexible framework is bolstered by fixing integral parts of the design, including public realm and connections to the site, as well as pivotal infrastructure such as community buildings, education and healthcare. These can be found throughout the parameter plans and development specification. The application capitalises on the excellent public transport in Eversleet and integrating further inter interventions to improve connectivity and support the use of public transport throughout Eversleet. A new station forecourt creating a sense of arrival at FC International and a mobility hub to support onward trips via public transport. There will be new and improved roads and junctions and a new dedicated bus route between International Way and South Street Road to connect into the wider garden city and improve journey times. Robust and extensive consideration of trans traffic implications of the proposals have been undertaking working closely with the highway authority and mitigation is proposed where capacity is not sufficient. We have carefully considered pedestrians and cyclists, designing attractive and safe routes through Evidence Central East, linking destinations and connecting into the surrounding area. To complement the high density nature of Esri, a network of public and open spaces and green routes are included in the design, providing outdoor play space and access to green and natural environments. These create opportunities for community events and enable important habitats and biodiversity to thrive. This is particularly important along the River Eversleet, where habitats will be improved and the river opened up for communities to enjoy. Ecological assessment and surveys have informed the design and mitigation and enhancement is outlined in the environmental statement. To conclude, the Eversley Central, Eversley Central East will deliver the heart of the Garden City, providing employment and new homes, setting a vibrant, active and well urban environment, supported by high quality, sustainable transport, public realm and open space. The proposals reflect national and local policy priorities and the application has been re recommended for approval by the case officer, whose report highlights the significant benefits that will be delivered should this application gain approval. I'm accompanied by key members of the design team today and we look forward to answering any questions you might have in respect to the application. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much indeed. Um, who would like to start? Talk about the long period um, development here mm -hmm. and need for adaptability. Could you just try to indicate to me what sort of long period are we talking about? I'm to get my head around that to begin with. I know there's two phases, but and what range of adaptability? Are we talking about? Is it just design, or usage, housing, and employment? Yes. Yeah, so, in terms of length, um, and given the scale of the application, we do expect that it will take um, sort of between twenty and thirty years to build out completely. Uh, it's likely to be phased, and um, so different sections of the site will come forward at different times. Um, it's likely that some enabling infrastructure will need to go in before any development can start, which also tends um, to lengthen the programme slightly. So it is a long period of time from the sort of first buildings that come forward all the way through to the development being complete. And then in terms of adaptability, it is all of those things you've just described from the makeup of the land uses, um, so the exact amount of employment or residential or retail floor space that comes forward, the design of the buildings, the design of the public realm and open spaces, all of those elements need to be adaptable um, depending on exactly how the development comes forward. But we've tried to secure <laughs> some really key integral pieces um, of the development through the parameter plans that don't have flexibility with a framework to adapt around it. Thank you. Anybody else like to ask David? Hello there. Yes, um, I'm quite interested in the this question. And one of the things that uh, leaps to mind is that, uh, and I've mentioned it slightly before, is the white elephant in the room, which is the uh, now possibly defunct London Resort. Now, that was something that would have been outside the area of this, but they did have a road that was due to run right down the, um, uh, the eastern side of this site, and obviously that's not there anymore. Now, I'd say that um, London Resort is defunct, Unfortunately, the NSIP that is actually carrying it is still going. Um, and I'm not sure that there is a legal a, a precedent to actually end an MSIP. They usually continue till they're finished. Will that have any effect on the plans that we're talking about now? And I'm referring really just to 
the fact that it's not there, but it is still there. Uh, so that's a very poor way of putting things. But does the NSIP that is in place and has not gone away, would it possibly have an impact on what we are trying to achieve actually in this area? So I'll go that up for Ruth, that's right, David. So yeah, so the road was due to be to the west of the Channel Tunnel Rail. West, sorry. Oh, that's yep, yep, sorry. Side. And it would have affected some of the application boundary in terms of the road access on the west. But yeah, you are yeah. right, the NSIP boundary was wider than just the road access and the peninsula. It does run, the status does run with the project, which as we believe is now in, in events. Obviously, this is all quite new, and, it, and you all know, as others do, that the Swanscombe Peninsula has recently been marketed. So it is something that we are actively are actively looking at, but we, <laughs> but we do not see it as an impediment to bringing forward the scheme uh, because of the state of play and, 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 and the movement away from that from that project at the moment. So the road definitely is not um, any form of issue for this application, and nor do we believe the, the, the wider project, which, as you say, now appears to be in some form of abeyance either. Is either. OK, I, I have a quick supplementary thing. One is the fact that um, one of the things we look at here as part of this is things like flooding, etc., that might affect the actual the actual area. However, what people tend to forget also is that um, the Ebsley site actually is causing flooding in surrounding areas like Eb like um, Swanscombe, and in particular Stanhope Road, which I think we talked about earlier, or I've talked about in other areas. Is there any way that we can try and find some way to adapt the land that is actually under the NSIP remit at the moment. The trouble is that when it was built up, a, a natural sort of drainage that went into the eastern side of the side east of Stanhope was blocked, which means now that every time it rains, we have a small river that replaces the road. Um, is there any way that we can do anything to do that or help that in this part of the plan? So David, I think um, the area that you're referring to, sort of Stanhope Road and on the Swanscombe side, um, so yeah. while this planning application only deals with the eastern side of MC Central, um, as yeah. a team, um, EDC are looking at that western side of MC Central as well. So we're currently looking at master planning and a feasibility study, looking at that whole corridor, um, so south of the peninsula, all the way down to the A2. So as part of that, we've got look into that um but it's definitely i think something for us to look at on the land on the western side of the railway rather than the eastern yes please please forgive my, my rather opportunist opportunity to to leap from what we were supposed to be talking about to an area that obviously um does damage some of the activities that i get up to in dartford so thank you very much and i appreciate it thank you um anybody else valerie that's good a couple of I suppose it's a sort of strategic issue, really. Um, it really is to help me get around the context of the scheme. Um, and the first is around the Council Chamber and the like, because it, it was really surprising to see how few uh, public consultation responses that I assume, or I hope, that's because. There was a lot of consultation and dialogue and uh, engagement. But what I can't see in this report anywhere is the feedback from that process. In other words, it just seems to me that, that there must be much, much more interest and consideration. I don't know where that information has been gathered or indeed how it's been addressed by the officers in terms of making this assessment. So, um, Barry, thank you for your question. Um, so in terms of engagement, so we undertook a lot of um, engagement prior to the application being submitted. Um, so we held um, a period of public consultation um, where we held four in-person events that were conducted around the site. So one in Northfleet, one in Swanscombe, one here at the observatory and one in Springhead Park. And because of the time um, timing of those, when we were sort of transitioning out of um, COVID precautions, we also held a number of webinars as well to complement them for people who didn't feel comfortable attending in person. Um, and we also had, um, for the full period of consultation, um, an online platform with all of the information where comments could be left. Um, so we had very good um, uh, 
attendance at those, so across the events and the webinars, they were attended by over 100 people. Um, and at, at those events, um, people could give us their comments there and then, um, could also leave them online and send them in to EDC. Um, and there were a set of questions um, and sort of free text boxes for people to be able to respond to. Um, all of that information was collated by the applicant team and it went into um, informing the design of the, of the proposals and all of that information is held in the statement of community involvement and also the design and access statement outlines how the design um, was then adapted to take account of those views that we received from the community. Thank you. So the, the, the second sort of contextual piece really is when I'm read the report, which is extensive, thank you, and it has a very positive recommendation at the end. And in part it's, I guess, because this is an outline application. Um, very often it, it read to me as if it was pretty light touch, frankly. Um, so a good example of that would be around building, uh, sorry, the um, the Building for Healthy Living Assessment, and it says very positively we can achieve 12 Greens, and there is no way, I think, that there is sufficient information, for example, to say at this early stage that we would be able to, or the development would achieve 12 Greens on that particular assessment. So we've got two other um, challenges, but areas raised, one from Tarmac, just recently around the uh, environmental statement, and then equally from Mr. Pratt around uh, whether there's been sufficiently wide consideration in relation to the MPPF and additional uh, transport infrastructure. From my side, I would say when I read this, it felt pretty light, frankly, as a report around archaeology and heritage imp impacts. It's not just the two listed churches, but the non heritage assets. And you know, the report just says, well, gosh, we can't dig up, we haven't done that sort of work yet. Um, but I'm sort of using an example, and, and it's an unfair question in a way, but I guess I'm seeking assurance from the officer team. I mean, are there other areas where you think actually we do need more work to be undertaken? Is there any more that we, you know what I mean? There's a huge amount of work that can I suggest the officers come back yes. on that after we've had um, questions from the applicants? Because yeah. okay. it feels like probably Minister so Michael and Simon to cover some. Yes, yeah, so some of those uh, points were on the officer report. So yeah. we'll leave. Okay, come back to it. Was there any specific, it's an applicant team you'd like us to answer, Valerie? Well, they're interrelated, aren't they? Because the applicant is providing the information. So I'm sort of, do, do you know what I mean? Um, I, I I don't know. It's the answer to that. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm well, trying to ask a strategic question. Yeah, I, to put this into an appropriate context that I can, you know, assimilate the information better and make okay. a better judgment as it were. I could maybe very briefly pick up on some of them. I mean, I won't pick up on um, the officer's report points and I'll let um, the officer come back on those. And in, the, in terms of archaeology, um, we have done a lot of work with KCC Heritage team um, and Historic England. Um, as you say, we haven't run any intrusive surveys to date, and that is because the site, the majority of the site is an operational car park and station facilities. And to do those intrusive surveys now uh, would be very disruptive to those ongoing activities, which are very important to the wider surrounding area and communities. Um, we have done um, an extensive amount of work on the desktop studies, so gone as absolutely as far as we can do without doing the intrusive work to assess what might be there. Um, and we're committed through the conditions to do the intrusive archaeology assessments um, and investigations prior to the detailed design of any parts of the site coming forward. So that if through that in intrusive um, investigation, anything is found in the ground, that can be taken into account in the design process the earliest stages of detailed design. Um, and then turning um, to uh, the tarmac um, letter, I might ask my colleague um, Luke, who's our um, transport consultant, to, to talk about that. 
um, but also just picking up um, on the comments made by the Kennex team. Um, we have, um, over a long period of time, been in touch with the Kennex team and um, keeping up to date, uh, keeping them up to date with what we're proposing at F Suite Central. Um, East and, and the outline planning application. Um, clearly, as, as I think we've demonstrated, it is a very sustainable location in terms of public transport, and we are seeking to enhance that further um, and to help people to make um, more sustainable choices in the way that they travel. Um, we don't feel that anything in the application, particularly because it is outlined, prejudices or precludes um, the schemes that the Kennex team talked us through um, and obviously very happy to continue to work with them as their proposals continue to emerge. Um, but Luke, did you want to... Just, just before oh, yeah, your transport colleague comes <laughs> forward, because maybe that we would like to touch on this as well. Um, from the perspective of the applicant, as opposed to the local planning authority officers, is there anything in the outline scheme which would preclude the introduction of trams at a later stage or preclude the southern uh, rail proposal, both of which um, Gordon Pratt referred to? So that's what I'd really like to feel for. Is there anything that precludes it? Um, so I think Luke will probably cover it in more detail, um, but I don't believe so, Neil. I think um, all of the all of those things can be accommodated within the outline scheme and, and we don't preclude it. You'll notice that the red line boundary doesn't include the station building or the railway lines. They are not owned by or operated by EDC. So anything um, within those um, sort of the platforms, the station, the actual station building itself and it's isn't controlled by EDC, but we work very closely with HS1 and DFT on the wider um, operational plans for the railway line. So I don't believe that um, anything in the outline application precludes those schemes that were mentioned by Gordon and the team. I interrupted when you were about to and um, on transport assistance. But so I think picking up on the tarmac, right, uh, the approach, the appraisal or scale. Um, their objection is one junction, so just to give you some reasons on what's been assessed, the whole corridor of Thames Way, of Sweet Gateway, down to the Eastern has been appraised as part of this planning application, but that's the assessment to determine what the impact might be and to identify mitigation for each of those junctions. Um, and that's been considered by Kent County Council and National Highways to their satisfaction as highway authorities. In terms of the specific point about tarmac, um, tarmac are, my interpretation, raising concern that the traffic volumes accounted for in that appraisal of one specific junction um, are inadequate. We've taken account of the information that has been in their planning for the site in question in the past and which has been supported by their own sort of renewals and alterations since right up to most recently in 2019. At all times, they have stood by the date that they in 2009. So we have simply taken the data that they to support their own application. The suggestion that there could be a change now, for whatever reason, is, is the nature of, um, of the process of planning that things are based on us at a point in time. It's the approach that we follow. That's the approach that's accepted by highway authorities. And it's been accepted here by both the National Highways and the Ken County Council. So we believe we've done both a thorough appraisal and an accurate appraisal. Sorry, now to another question to them, please. Have you done any studies? Uh, got the maximum floor space on the site, then a, a, a raft of maximum potential figures, but there isn't a minimum uh, figure for numerous of the you know, number of the categories. We've now agreed a retail figure. Have you done any studies? What, what is the correct proportion? How do we know that we're going to deliver from this generally sort of sustainable community if we don't 
have a, an understanding of what might be an appropriate minimum to suit a safe for leisure, for example. I mean, are there not any analyses or is there research, is there something that we could rely on or that you've relied on that you feel confident that in the absence of minimum spaces, we would still deliver, you know, a genuinely sustainable community in every sense of the word? So I think what is challenging when you have a flexible application like this one is that the the correct portions will depend on how development comes forward, particularly the balance between residential and employment development. Um, so rather than setting minimums that that would need to sort of almost assume a scenario to set what that appropriate minimum would be, we have left it very flexible um, throughout the, the draft planning conditions. Um, that accompany the case officer's report, um, there are minimums set and they tend to um, be based on a floor space linked to a number of residential um, units out of employment floor space. Um, so as the, the detail of the scheme starts to become clearer, those conditions kick in to ensure that a flexible minimum, depending on what comes forward, is set. So we sought to um, ensure that you get that mix of uses throughout the scheme through um, those draft conditions rather than setting a minimum in the development specification that has no flexibility at all. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, related to that, I guess it's, it, it, it creates a doubt again. So I was, you know, read obviously about the employment opportunities we're talking about two and a half thousand construction temporary jobs may or may not be right i don't know but you're talking about a minimum of one and a half thousand job creation which is incredibly few and that then makes one doubt again the viability around the all these other and single but really important uses sort of commercial space business space you know the employment space it's so small and again it wouldn't deliver a sustainable community We've got 90 minutes to London, it's true, but actually what you want is people to live and work in, in the same environment. So why why are your assessments? I, I realise it goes up to 10,500, sevenfold increase, but, but why are the assessments so small then, you know, in terms of job growth? So the, the job creation and the figures that are in the environmental statement, so the environmental statement used, um, because of the amount of flexibility, used two sort of discrete scenarios for assessment. So one is a minimum commercial and one is a minimum residential to test the extremes of those two um, uh, assessment scenarios. So that is why you get such a big swing in, in the different amount of creation, because one is assuming you know, a minimum. And I think um, to ensure that the environmental statement and the assessments within it were robust. We have taken a very careful and conservative approach to things like socioeconomic benefits. We have made sure that we aren't sort of overinflating those as part of the assessment. So that is why you get that very big swing. Um, I think we would absolutely like to ensure that the job creation is more than that. Um, and, and that will very much depend on how development comes forward. But I think that is the reason why you see that very big swing in job creation through the environmental statement. Um, anybody else for any other questions at this stage? Yeah, I suppose just go. So no, you no? Just... Right. Well, thank you very much indeed to the applicant team, and we now move to going to invite you to retake your seats move to a more general uh, discussion. Um, any views? We perhaps start with what Valerie was asking around the yes. assessment and yes, wouldn't be healthy life. Yes, we can deal with that first. Yeah, and I think in terms of the question around sort of the report and some references to sort of light touch, I think, as I mentioned in the presentation, what we're trying to establish here is the framework for, see, for future decisions, future work that's going to need, need to be done maybe at, at, at the right time. I think the example around is it heritage and, and, and archaeology, I know that's something there's been lots of discussions with, with KCC heritage in particular. Um, as well as historic England in terms of what, what information needed now, what information can, can follow. A lot of, as I think the applicant said, a lot of work has been done, a lot of desktop work has been done. Now we appreciate there are physical um, impractical, impracticalities with 
digging up surface car parking at, at this stage. Um, I think what we kind of agreed in the end with with with, with the, the the statutory consultees was about triggers triggers for requirements work to be done. We know as as per that structure that the table that I showed at the end of this presentation, archaeological field work site investigation needs to be done to inform reserve matters. So, um, as per I think the original plan permission for Edgley Valley, it was the same thing. Not too much up front, but you do the work as you go through to then inform the detailed design. So that's the approach that's proposed here. So I think in it from our perspective, you can always maybe provide more information, but we felt it was at the right level of to assess the impacts there and be confident that impacts can be mitigated through detailed design and the assessments at a later point. So I think we're comfortable with that on, on, on that point. But there's a question around, around building for healthy life and the information we use to assess it that I think probably pass over to Simon. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. So in terms of assessing value for healthy life, because it's an outline master plan, you've got the uh, parameter plans and then you've got the illustrative, illustrative master plan. And there's a constraint to how much you can assess against each of the 12 categories within the building for healthy life against those two different uh, information types. So with regard to the parameter plans, I would accept that there's a number of categories that you literally cannot uh, assess against because of the level of detail. Um, so the way we undertook the building for health life was to assess the categories that we were, were able to uh, in the parameter plans, but then we were able to assess all of the uh, categories for the illustrative master plan. But So that's the first point, and I would accept that there are some. So, for example, street to front door, uh, which is to do with the design of that space between the street and the, and the facade, um, given the, the level of detail, even at an illustrative master plan stage, it's, it's still constrained. So that, that was a very light yeah. touch assessment against that category, but I was comfortable that, you know, the conditions, the spatial conditions associated with that category were met satisfactorily for me to be able to grant it a green at this stage. It wasn't conflicting, certainly, with anything I would expect. Uh, and then the second point I would make is that the Building for Healthy Life is only one of our assessments. So we undertake a whole range of assessments. We assess against the implementation framework. We did an audit against the principal set down implementation framework. We assessed against the sustainable travel strategy and the guidance and in that particular document, the public realm strategy, we did a very detailed uh, assessment of all the junction designs as well. So there was a whole range of assessments over and above building for healthy life that fell into the design log that was then reported back to uh, to Michael as the planning officer. So I would accept that the building for healthy life is perhaps um, not uh, as comprehensive as it may be in a reserve matters application, but it was backed up with a whole range of other assessments um, that gave that would allow me to with some comfort, score it with those 12 greens. Can I just follow up on that? Does that mean that, in effect, the conclusion is that a reserve matters application that complies with all the conditions, parameter plans, and so on, would be capable of achieving the outcomes you assessed? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And not only that, the, the spatial characteristics I would expect to achieve a green in a reserve master's application are within the parameter plans where you would expect them to be and also demonstrated in the illustrative master plan. So, yeah. Thank you. Anything else from the officers asking for anything extra, but anything else you'd like to say? Um, I think just a quick one on on the, the minimum you mentioned about the, the minimum uses and how the applicant kind of responded. I think a key a key next stage is that there's a non-residential usage strategy proposed for a planning condition, and that's um, that includes uh, an element around the approach to provision of other non-residential uses to support the development. So I think there are certain uses that maybe in planning terms we can't necessarily think it's appropriate to set a minimum, maybe, maybe leisure, maybe hotel, but these are key. I think key uses in terms of making the scheme work from an applicant side of view and sort of point of view in a way and kind of getting occupiers, et cetera. I think if you're looking to bring in maybe business occupiers, you want to be providing things like coffee shops, gyms, good public realm that's actually going to make, and maybe maybe even looking at heritage cultural interpretation to make something a bit more bespoke about this about this site that might attract people. So I think there's probably a combination of things that maybe more the market's going to drive than maybe a planning permission can, could require just to make sure that the space works. And I think that the non-residential usage strategy is a key key tool to kind of secure in that. Thank you. And uh, now general discussion contributions, anything anybody would like to say? David, you look as though you're about to say something, but don't feel you have to. <laughs> I, 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 I find these quite remarkable because we're talking about something that we're looking at plans for 
not completion for 30 years. And the way markets move within 30 years could be in all kinds of different directions. So I do really appreciate the work that's been done on this in a way to try and make it uh, palatable for everyone. And it's not going to be very easy because obviously we don't know what is coming our way. Um, hence the fact we've got bridges there that go nowhere because they were put in because we thought once upon a time they would. But that's what we have to do here. We have to look at something that we can use and mould, if you like, into the future. So uh, I've always, I was always quite entertained by the fact that there was lots of car parks put out there. I'm sure there must have been archaeological activity before they decided to put the car parks down. But now it's made it a bit difficult for us to do anything. Um, a lot of this falls into Dartford, without a doubt. But to be honest with you, I think it's going to be quite an exemplary part of, uh, of Eversley. Difficult one because you don't know what's going to come tomorrow. But at the same time, I think uh, I think they've done a very good job on it. I certainly don't envy the officers for doing what they've done because they really had to stare into a crystal ball in many respects. But that which they've done has been extremely good. Um, I have no more comment than that, to be honest with you. I just think it's been a job well done. But I do realise that there are elements of element of apparent weakness, but I do also see them are, there are mitigating reasons for that. Um, that's really all I need to say, I think, at this point. And there's somebody said something really interesting that I'll come back on. <laughs> thank you, David. Fred. Um, thank you, uh, Neil. Um, really echoing uh, much of what David just said around flexibility, around trying to predict um, what use requirements are going to be. I think the uh, the uh, applicant has done a good job in in looking at what that mix might be um, with attempting to put some minima where minima are possible to ensure a balanced development, but not go so far as to box um, uh, box people into a mix that just turns out not to be appropriate uh, in the future. So I'm content with that. I've thought quite hard about the two transport issues raised by objectors. Um, I'm happy with the explanation given around uh, tarmac traffic numbers um, and don't have concerns that we are operating irrationally in that regard. Um, I take a similar view on the tram. Um, a tram is often a good thing to have uh, if people are prepared to pay the enormous capital sums to build it. Um, and if it is approved and funded and built, um, uh, and that give, go ahead is given within the time frame of the detailed application. I'm sure that I take comfort from the fact that it is not precluded. But I also do not, I'm impressed with the extent to which the applicant has looked at sustainable, what well, transport generally and sustainable transport within that. And um, as far as I'm aware, and unless officers tell me different, there is nothing that requires um, us to um, uh, to create provision for uh, speculative schemes, uh, even if those schemes are ones we might support if they were brought um, forward. So I'm content that we have uh, considered transport at the earliest planning stage possible again unless officers uh, advise me differently thank you fred lee yes i will concur with the two uh, previous speakers because quite simply we don't know what it's going to look like over a period of 30 years and i think that the amount of information we have here is digest that we gone into more detail we would have volumes um I think that um, it's an opportunity. Strategically, it's a great opportunity. And I'm actually quite surprised that it hasn't come forward sooner and the down to the Epsley Development Corporation to drive this in. I think it will 
be very significant and will have a tremendous impact on the two boroughs that we represent here in terms of employment, in terms of residents, community building. I think the opportunity is, but I think we shouldn't be looking for too many details at this point. We have to be realistic. And yes, there could be, well, opportunities for different transport schemes, but we have to be realistic um, in terms of both their costs and who would be prepared to fund that money cost. So yeah, I think I would add my compliments to the team, uh, to the applicants who put this all together. Great, the opportunities are there. It's obviously going to take a long time and it's going to exercise the minds of people, different generations and perhaps us around here in the future. But yes, at least we're driving something forward. And I've seen so many schemes which have developed or proposals that developed in great detail, but now gather dust on planning departments shelves. So this is great. Yeah. Anything else from anybody? Batteries. Lots of several other questions, if I may. Thoughts. Um, and I, I absolutely agree with colleagues. So this is a, a wonderful opportunity, uh, a very large and very complicated scheme. And I enjoyed the way that it's been presented, you know, this sort of uh, parameter plans and then this layered approach and the key design principles and so on and so forth, because it's a bit like how do you eat an elephant, you know what I mean? And actually it was understandable. And I I'm, I'm absolutely signed up to it. I guess there are still some things in, in here, though, that I would like a little bit more assurance on. One is it talks a, a lot about connectivity, but actually when you look, and we haven't got the master plan yet, um, particularly around pedestrian and uh, bicycle cycling connectivity, essentially got is, is quite high density development and then a whole series of major roads frankly which separate the area sixes which are essentially the parkland and i don't know how much has been considered to whether it is genuinely possible for people who are in that intense developed area which is essentially to the west of the site to easily get access to the east of the site where you've got well, we've got you know, you can see the beautiful apartment that we've come forward. So that was one. I don't know whether I should do it one by one or whether I should just go through the things. They're not really related. I'll see if you go through them. Okay, so, so that was one issue. The other, and I guess all of life is timing. You know, we've just come through an election campaign and time and again in the various debates that uh, people all around the country actually were saying, gosh, we've got housing developments coming forward but there's a lack of social infrastructure. And the health provision um, does worry me in that uh, we're talking about a trigger point. It was originally a thousand houses. It's come down to 400 houses, but the ICB was very clear that there is zero capacity. It actually says that before, nil. So we get to 400. It might be that we can use that as a trigger, but actually it equally says, well, gosh, maybe we just take an offsite provision. So you know, there appears to me to be the potential for a void in terms of the health provision, which I think uh, does need to be addressed. The other was more interesting, I guess, which is uh, colleagues from Ducks and Gratian were saying, look, isn't it great? We've got 35% affordable housing, but the report says actually they would like 50% in each borough. And I know that's a kind of wish list and we shouldn't be um, governed by administrative boundaries, particularly when our own red line is different. On the other hand, I can see that in terms, again, of having, you know, happy communities, as it were, and genuinely mixed uh, communities in, say, 20, 30 years time, that would be advantageous. And I've no idea how that's going to be shared out, as it were, given, again, we've got the zoning. <clears throat> and the last point is really around bringing forward the reserve matters applications because each of them ultimately will be interrelated. So how do we know that if we are 
bringing forward one reserve matters application, that says for transport, but it almost doesn't matter, that actually it will be realistic and deliverable if something else comes forward down the line, which is conflicting in terms of the reserve matter content. Um, and it may, I don't know if it's even possible to answer this, but you know, if we want to deliver the garden city concept, then we need to make sure that actually that interrelationship is manageable in some way. So there are sort of four things that are running around my head. So, Mike, can I ask you to answer yeah. on those? So it's connectivity, health, affordable housing, and comprehensive development reserve matters. I didn't use the word comprehensive development, but, but, but no. That's what I've written down. Yeah, that's um, that's absolutely fine. Um, so yeah, question one around connectivity to the west. Obviously, the the, the high speed lines are pretty big barriers, isn't it? To that, mm -hmm. and it was mentioned before about the the um the unfinished bridge parts that was put in from from the offset to provide that kind of connectivity. So, um, I think I think more immediately, um, the link the link to propose through would be there's proposed enhancements to to to, to um to make international way two way. Obviously, we're talking about traffic there, but I know you're talking more about pedestrian cycle links. But as part of that, that would be that would be put in a continuous uh, pedestrian cycle link along that route. I know at the moment that walk isn't particularly friendly because as you get to the roundabout, you have to kind of either cut across or go the long way around. But this would kind of improve that more directly between the station and east to to the, to the western side. And I think there's the proposal for the um, fast track bus only link to between International Way and South Fleet Road, which would provide that connect connection between there and and Castle Hill and onwards into in, into Eastern Quarry as well. So I think that that's part of a wider improved connection from the wider western area of the, of the Garden City in terms of Eastern Quarry and and the western area to, to, to the east. Obviously, the second point I think is around the unfinished bridge plaza, which this scheme, as I mentioned in the presentation briefly safeguards that so this this element of scheme this planning permission of granted would kind of fix the requirement to provide access up to that so i think you saw from the photo one of the photos it's it's gone up here really high inaccessible it's a huge space and a huge opportunity but obviously what this scheme would commit would commit to doing is getting the access up to that and using that space obviously it's not committing this point to an onward future connection but as the applicant mentioned works around absolute central west regarding Councillor Moat's question around sort of drainage and Stanhope Road. Equally, I think the connection through there is probably the, if not one of the most important kind of principles for the, for the western section. So, in time, hopefully that wider connection comes. But for now, this scheme is future proofing. I think that 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 link. Um, that's probably what I'll say on question one. Um, in terms of healthcare trigger, the supplementary report did pick up a typo. It's proposed by 300 occupations as opposed to 400. There was a lot of discussion with the NHS around that because I think still from experience that's still a really early trigger for for anything really, let alone a pretty much a thousand square meter um, healthcare facility. Um, there's obviously the, the desire, maybe corporately from the applicant, to provide something more that maybe serves the wider garden city. So the, the 984 square meters is what's needed to mitigate the impact of this this scheme, these 2,000 odd, odd units. But I know there's obviously the, the separate discussions around something something bigger, something better in discussion with the NHS as well and subject to funding from other parties as well. So um, there is, yeah, it is looking to kind of address the, 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 the wider the, the wider scheme. But I think, yeah, 300 occupations is quite early. Um, I think that the NHS pushing, there's a big negotiation around that, but that seems so an early trigger, an appropriate trigger. I didn't think we really felt it reasonable to push push further than that. The, the planning condition that requires that does allow for a temporary facility and to be, be provided. So there's potential for something temporary coming coming earlier. And I think there's a discussion there, but the conditions kind of set in, set in the line. This is what it is, unless there's another another agreement. So there's there's a potential for that. But um, as it is, I think we're quite comfortable with that as 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 a, to be honest, a fairly early trigger. Um, in terms of affordable housing and the split between Gresham and, and Dartford, I think there's a practical point here because in terms of securing the affordable housing, the, us as the LPA and the applicant can't enter into an agreement with ourselves. So the applicant side of EDC would enter into agreement with Dartford for Dartford lands and Gratian for Gratian land. So almost by default, 35% applies for any homes in Gratian, 35% would be affordable. Any homes in Dartford would be 35% affordable as well. So that kind of, in a roundabout way, ensures it's equally spread between the two authorities. And um, things like the, the housing diversification strategy would look at and the area master plans spread distribution of affordable housing across it, but the one of six requirements will be Croatia has that bit, Dartford has that bit, and then it's how they distribute it throughout. 
um, those, those individual areas. So I think that kind of say, addresses the comments that were raised from both Dartford and Grosham in a roundabout way. And I think the fourth point was around reserve matters and how to ensure a comprehensive de development. There was lots of discussions early on around do we need a site-wide master plan for the whole for the whole site? Um, I think because EC1 and EC2 are so physically separate, um, the high speed sort of spur kind of physically breaks them. They kind of they can both kind of maybe wash their own face in a way. So there is a requirement for the area master plans to be coming in for the entirety of one phase, EC1 or EC2. So I think that provides the intent to provide that kind of more strategic kind of um, comprehensive approach to the little pieces of the puzzle that come forward as individual reserve masses, ensure they're all, all aligned and, and, and comprehensive. And certainly the first area master plan needs to go a little bit further and review how that, how that aligns with, if it's EC2, for example, that comes forward first, how that aligns with proposals for EC1. And in my simple mind, make sure you leave enough floor space left to do EC1 properly as well. Um, there are site-wide strategies that I think kind of inform that as well. That will look at where there's retail, where there's this, where there's that, so where, where the school goes. So I think the combination of strategies, area master plans, I think provide probably quite a clear kind of cohesive framework to ensure reserve matters can be in, assessed independently, but as part of a bigger picture. Don't know that helps. Yeah, yeah, sort of. I mean, it's almost, can you, we won't know until we start the process really. But another thing, sorry, so I'm hogging this. Another thing that struck me again in, in the report, HS1 was saying we've got 2,000 parking spaces. Why can't we use them? And actually, that would be a much better use of, of the land because it would release more space, wouldn't it, for development and, and so on. And actually, if it might drive more people to use more sustainable forms of transport, if in fact some of those 2,000 were used rather than delivered elsewhere. I have no idea how that. Work. But again, it just struck me as being a good idea and a good opportunity. But it wasn't really. Well, well, absolutely. I think. I mean, I think maybe even from from an LPA side and probably an applicant side as well. If, if, if station parking can be reduced going forward, I think that's 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 the ideal. And there's a planning conditional condition to require existing station parking and facilities to be replaced unless there's an agreement with HS1 that maybe reduced parking can be provided. Obviously, the, the scheme's talking about. Um, putting surface parking into multi-storey car parks, which clearly is very expensive. So if there can be agreement to provide less, then I'm sure I'm looking at the applicant side, they'll probably bite your hand off about that. So, um, but there's a discussion with, with HS1. So there is a flexibility within the conditions to allow that. There is, yes. Um, so it's all helpful, which is too much respect, I think. Um, anything else from anybody? Otherwise, I think it's probably time to move on to the recommendation. Um, well, we have the recommendation, and just to remind ourselves, that set out in supplementary report. Um, and also, I noticed the point on the 300th as opposed to 400th residential patient is just above that report, so that is that has been corrected in the papers. Um, uh, unless Mark's about to tell me anything else, I'm going to put the recommendation. Carry on. Are you going to say something oh, else? No. Um, so I'll put the recommendation. Um, those in favour? Yes. Well, that is unanimous. So uh, that resolution is passed. So that uh, ends this item, and thank you very much indeed to everybody who's contributed. I think we've had a healthy discussion, and my part, I'm very grateful to applicant, the objectors, and also to all members of the committee who've um, pursued some of these points, because it's really important that we discuss these things properly um, and investigate them. So thank you very much. Right, next item on the agenda is item six, Eastern Square River. We'll let anybody who's not interested in that go. Neil, can we have a two minute break? Yes, of course. Two minutes. Well,
renewed somehow. Fred okay. David, can you hear us? Yep. yep. Good, yes. thank you. Right, on to the next item on the agenda, which is item six, Eastern Quarry. Um, and we've got the report from Mark, so I'm going to ask Mark to introduce this report. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Neil. There's no presentation. I haven't got any fancy slides, I'm afraid. So you're going to have to um, you're going to have to listen to me. So um, yes, yeah, I just wanted to draw members' attention um, to the report. Uh, agenda item six. Um, there's also the applicant submission, which is attached in in Annex uh, A, um, um, along with uh, an accompanying plan, uh, and then there's a draft response letter from uh, from EDC in, in 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 Annex B. So this uh, matter essentially comes down to uh, a request from uh, the landowner, Eastern Quarry Limited, who own who own Eastern Quarry, um, to uh, for EDC to provide a judgment. Sort of an, 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 an opinion uh, on a planning enforcement matter. Um, pretty fair to say um, we haven't had one of these um, discussions at committee before. It's quite common for developers to be asking at an LPA what their view is um, in terms of, um, for example, enforcing enforcing a planning trigger. Um, for example, we had something recently at Spring and Park, uh, the allotments. Um, countryside uh, in that scenario, for example, weren't able to be providing the, the allotments at the point that they were required to be provided. Uh, there was on-site logistical issues with that. We worked with them, we agreed with those uh, logistical issues, and then whether, whether an LPA takes enforcement action or not is always a judgment call. In this instance, we have a request uh, in advance of a trigger being met. Uh, as a house builder um, has, has, uh, has been uh, liaising with, uh, with EQL, uh, with Eastern Quarry, a landowner, um, and they would like some uh, some comforts in terms of our likely approach um, to to particular 
um, schedules in the 106, so not the whole of the 106, um, particular schedules which are outlined in paragraph 2.2 uh, of the of the report. Um, as I said, my uh, draft letter is attached to Annex B. Um, in summary, um, the recommendation is for us to be issuing the letter um, so that we um, confirm that we are not minded to enforce specific obligations outlined in paragraph 2.2 on the specific parcel, which is um, in the in the attached uh, plan. This would allow the land sales to take place. Um, it would assist delivery um, across Eastern Quarry. Uh, the landowner has confirmed that the receipt would be used to deliver uh, the temporary secondary school, which um, EDC um, and local partners, particularly the Education Authority, are very keen to see um, delivered. That would then be um, temporary secondary school places opening in September 2025. Um, and I feel that there is sufficient land remaining within the quarry uh, for us to be enforcing those obligations on the remaining quantity of development that is left. Uh, this, this, as I say, relates to a particular section of land, uh, but there is a significant, um, significant number of number of dwellings, well, different amount of development um, left where if we did then want to uh, enforce that obligation, we were able to. Um, that was my presentation. Thank you, Chair. So recommending that we that we that we send the letter. I know that we do have a registered speaker. Thank you. So registered speaker, I think, is Peter Nelson of Pender Camland. Um, I'm looking at the terms of reference and the public representations can be made in relation to planning matters that it determines. And on that basis, I'm uh, happy for you to make a presentation and grateful that you're here to answer any questions, but no more than five minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you're muted, actually, I think. I'm not sure oh, pearls of wisdom, but we can't. Uh, well, I can hear him. No, As we can. can I. Hear, Sounds as though those online can hear. But he we're, we're really good. Said. <laughs> right, right, thank you. Yeah, we're all start again if you'd started, please. Thank, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you very much. OK, thanks. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Peter Nelson. I'm the project director for the uh, Eastern Quarry site. I'm the director of, of Eastern Quarry Limited. I'm primarily here to answer any questions, but I just um, I won't take up too much of your time. Just by way of kind of high level background, uh, a massive developer, our role is to provide the earthworks, the infrastructure, landscaping and civic buildings required in the Section 106. So we provide service land parcels for the for the house builders. And apart from the initial investment from ourselves and Homes England, who are very supportive of this project, the cost of works is funded by those aforementioned land sales. The receipts go into a ring fence cash account that is then used on the infrastructure and building the civic buildings, and the accounts monitored and approved by Homes England. As Mark said, it's a condition of a couple of the larger developers who are developing and taking occupations through the next couple of years when we're building these civic buildings. That once they've actually paid their funds into the um, into the account, that they're released from the joint and several obligations related to the delivery of those parcels. They've paid their money, and therefore they don't want to be kind of uh, bound to do that. But the obligation remains with us as master developer, and um, and, and, and risk sits with ourselves as master developer. But so I've written to Mark to ask his permission uh, for that responsibility to pass to us in regards to this one parcel, which is phase two of Alcott and South Red Road. And we're asking you to give authority to to agree to that. Uh, I think probably better if you ask me questions, really, if you, if you have any. Um, can I start with one question? Yeah, of course. In your letter, um, which you wrote in support of this application, um, you say that the payments are paid into an account for co signatories being Henley Camland. Yeah, and Cam 801 Limited. Yeah, um, and Homes England. Mm -hmm. and monies from this account have to be spent on the delivery of infrastructure in Section 106. Yeah, obligations required to service the parcel, such as the temporary school. 
Um, two questions. I'd like some further detail and reassurance as to the terms that apply to that account. And secondly, you say such as the school. I mean, for my part, keen to see the school delivered and other infrastructure. So how do we know it's meant to be infrastructure, but how do we know what this money is likely to be spent for? So there are two questions. One, reassurance on the signatory point, and two, uh, how do we know what it's going to be spent on? Yeah, OK, so if I take the signatory points first, um, Henry Camlands um, is the vehicle with the bank accounts, but that is the uh, all of the shares in Eastern Quarry Limited are owned by Henry Camlands. So that's that's the relationship. One hundred percent of the shares of Eastern Quarry Limited are owned by Henry Camland eight hundred one, um, and then the accounts is held in the name of uh, Henry Camland eight hundred one and Homes in and Homes England uh, are the second signatory on that account. So I, we can't make any payments at all out of that account until Homes England have certified and agreed them. And, and what happens if Homes England say, well, could you use it to repay some of the debt rather than to pay for infrastructure? What's the protection for that? So we've got a facility um, agreement with Homes England um, and that sets out um, how, how the money is spent and the order in which it, it is spent. And it's accompanied by a, a business plan, the cash flow, which shows the delivery of the um, of, of all of the infrastructure and land first, and then the only time that any debt can be repaid is once uh, there is sufficient money in that account to fund any remaining cost obligations left with it. By cost yeah. obligations, those are six obligations. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the cost obligations are the section 106 and the um, uh, and infrastructure obligations, so such as the fast track corridor, the, the 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 prime roads into the site, the landscaping, etc. There's a list of works in, in, in that facility document that Mark has seen sites of. Obviously, we, um, it, it's not a document we can put in the public realm, but Mark has seen sites of that document. And how do we know what it's going to be spent on? What's the second part? So how this initial money, obviously, we've got a, a, a program and a cash flow that we also uh, is, is a condition of our facility with Homes England and the the next key items in terms of our infrastructure spend is the is the temporary uh, the temporary school. Um, and then we'll be starting work uh, on the main school with, with probably within the next two months beyond that. But initially we've um, engaged a contractor called Premier Modular who um, and, and placed an order with them to deliver the temporary school. Permanent school takes two years to build. So we want to have, uh, as Mark said, education facilities in place from September 2025, which when the demand is there, and then the school will open on a phased basis. Um, the, the, the permanent secondary school and then the second primary school and the sports centre will open on a phased basis starting from September 26. Thank you. Sorry, I've hogged it so far, so over to others. Fred. Yeah, Neil, I think I must have misunderstood the papers, or maybe I did understand the papers. Is, is the money going to be used to build the temporary school? Yes. That's an undertaking? Yes. Can we make sure that that undertaking, please, is recorded? Um, because the description that you gave does not seem to me to reflect that. So going into an account which can be used to pay all sorts of stuff, uh, subject to a business plan which can be changed, is not the same as an undertaking that the money goes to the school. That's critically important um, uh, in, in this context, it seems to me. So I don't know how that is done, but echoing the chairman's remarks, I'm not sure the letter, I am sure the letter does not give us that. Anybody else like to uh, contribute? 
we I'm just trying to uh, think about more response to Fred's uh, very, very valid point. Um, so we could change the draft response letter on the basis that we will accept um, accept the terms, uh, you know, as it were, uh, subject to evidence that the money is going to be used for the secondary school. Yeah, undertaking. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm undertaking it in, in what form, Fred? So you might need to help me out a bit. I, look, I don't want to. I'm happy to. I'm kind of happy to. Um, subject to you, Chair and others to. Um, have officers agree the final wording of the letter, but the from a committee perspective, uh, all I want to be certain about is that in all circumstances that money will be used to pay for the, to, the school and how you write that I don't mind. We we could thinking aloud have a recommendation which that the authority is delegated to the director of planning place to issue a letter And I think we have to say something more about the letter to give some, but subject to receiving an undertaking from, it would have to come though, and Fred, I welcome your view. If the signatory on this account is Homes England and Henley Camlin, they both have an influence on what the money is spent on. Yes. So, it, uh, it may need to go may, may, may need to go into a different account. Or it may need to be that the undertaking comes from Henley Camland and Home Homes, Homes England. And Homes yeah. England. That creates a um administrative issue, shall I think is probably the polite way of putting it. Yeah, that's what I was trying to avoid, Neil. <laughs> um I, I'm sure there are there are ways of doing this. Uh, you could have home signet acknowledging uh, the undertaking. You all all sorts of ways it can be done, but it sounds, Peter, as though that there is no commercial issue from your side in giving that undertaking. It doesn't strike me, you know, legally that it should be difficult to craft something that is binding. Um, but but I suspect that trying to do so from this committee room is 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 probably not the the best way to to do it yeah and you you are right um fred commercially it shouldn't be an issue we've already started to do some of that work uh in, in preparation uh we've got to get the planning consent through but we prepare uh, some of the uh, works is already part of the existing consent, so we're implementing what we can. And as I say, that's kind of next in our programme of key works to do. So the Homes England piece, uh, Chair's right, um, <laughs> does open up more of an administrative piece. And as a, as a large public body, they're very limited to what they can and can't say, but they can certainly acknowledge, um, you know, uh, and have done in the past uh, kind of written letters that have acknowledged the position as, as set out. Without, they just won't guarantee anything. I, I, you, you, they'll never guarantee anything. Could I just question the need to have both done? Obviously, as the account needs to be authorised yeah. by both. I think if we have an undertaking for one, then that, ult that ultimately does restrict um, the way in which those funds are used. So, an undertaking from EQL isolation, yeah. um, Homes England will have to see you know, follow that. I don't think the Homes England are able to overrule that feature. Is there? The, the issue, Mark, is that they probably have security over that account. Uh, and if they um, foreclose on their debt, they can snaffle the money. And that's the bit we don't want to happen. And you don't want to happen, Peter. <laughs> no, I mean, ultimately, uh, they're, they're committed to delivery of the facilities on site as much as we are, really, the way in which the, the loan is repaid, ultimately, is by houses being delivered down the line. So they're, they're, they're kind of exactly okay. the same position is this is not a traditional banking arrangement I understand that I understand that which should make it easier for them to um uh give the undertaking and or acknowledge in a binding way that undertaking 
So it's the recommendation would have to change to issue a letter in the form outlined at Annex B subject to finalisation by the director. You could put consultation with the chair of the committee, but the delegation would have to be to the director. I'd, I'd be very happy to support that. Then the finalisation, there isn't any reference there to an undertaking. Have subject to an undertaking and finalisation of the. I mean, the finalisation of the letter could be you don't finalise it till you get the undertaking. But no, I just wanted to be clear that that yes, the committee was yes. also an undertaking. Yeah, um, subject to an undertaking from. So let's just. It's always a mistake to try and draft things on the hoof and. Mm -hmm. Let's try I think again. essentially it's um, so the recommendation at the moment to give delegated authority to the director of planning in place to issue the draft letter attached to Annex B. I think are we saying subject to um, uh, an undertaking being entered into subject? Yes. By yeah. Eastern Quarry Limited. Um, yes. Tim, can I just check as well when we talk about an undertaking? Are we talking about a Section 106 undertaking made by way of deed no. or something? It's a legally binding, it might be my way of D, but it's a legally binding commitment. I think what well, if it becomes a section 106 agreement, we then get amending yeah. and section 106 yes. agreement, it becomes far too complex. Mm. So we're not, in my mind, talking about a section 106 planning obligation. And also we can't issue the draft letter attached because it's going to be <laughs> That's what I'm just trying to check whether whether the draft letter itself needs to be changed because if once we've got the undertaking, then there's no reason to not issue the letter. I don't think so. Okay, so the letter itself, to... I think, stands. Yes. Yep. It would just be issuing it subject, subject to having. Um, I would like to put in finalised form because it gives us a bit more ability to change if we need to. Okay. So subjects recommend give delegated authority to the director of subjects to and it is Eastern Quarry or Hendy Camlin 801 Limited. Hendy Camlin 801 Limited are the signatory to the bank account. Any would be whoever has the bank account. And the undertaking we're looking for is that the money is used for the purposes to construct education facilities. For the, for the avoidance of doubt, the funds received are in, in in excess of the cost of the school, the temporary school. So I can't think all of, you know, we just need to get the wording right around that. So some of you know, the, the necessary amount of the monies received are utilised towards that. Facilities, including the temporary school. Yeah. Sorry, how much is the temporary school? Uh, it's about, I think my budget's coming in around two and a half million. And the rest would go towards the permanent secondary school, which is up to here. Yes, well, it, it, it goes towards kind of what's in the uh, in the, the cash flow model. There's various infrastructures and, and other land sales to come in. There's other funding to come in, but specifically over the next three months or so, the, the temporary school is the kind of next thing on the agenda. That's why I'm comfortable to kind of say commercially, that's what it's going to be used for. What, what else? Sorry, and what else? OK, that's didn't do. So when you say a bunch of other things, Again, we're back to what Neil was asking. What other things? Does it include, for instance, interest on debt? Just for instance, it cannot be used for those purposes. It can only be used for Section 106. Yeah, the, the list of the works, yeah. The site works is all it can be used for. You'll need to build that in, Mark, to the letter or the undertaking. Write some, uh, write something down to draw this together. Um, yes, 
Well, I was going to ask you for some wording. <laughs> just, just, on, just on the principle, we, we mentioned Hendley Campbell HC801 lift. It, is it still the case that we're looking at that undertaking to be lift or entered into given by Homes England also? No, because with the uh, for the reasons that Mark gave, there are two. We're told there are two signatories to it. Uh, they both have to sign it off. So if, we, if one is locked in, they're both locked. In. The account is locked in. Hmm. Um, so, Tim, not to put you too tightly on the spot. No, it's fine. Um, um, so it's just something along the lines of. Um, a recommendation to give delegated authority to the director of planning in place to issue the draft letter in the form attached as Alex subject to receipt to the satisfaction of the director of planning in place in consultation with the chair of the planning committee. an undertaking given by HC801 Limited that the funds referred to in the Eastern Quarry letter dated 20th of June 2024 are to be used solely for the provision of education facilities, including provision of the temporary school. I think we're saying though that because it goes into the account yeah. and the amount of money is two million pounds and this is six million pounds, that there will be money spent on these. Or almost if 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 a letter's issued, I don't want to you know, if, if we don't need to spend six million pounds on the school, there isn't any need to, to ring fence the whole thing. If we can then put, put, put four million into delivery of fast track or, or, or some other earthwork. So I think we need to loosen the purpose yeah. of it. Provision of infrastructure pursuant to planning obligations, including the provision of a temporary school. Yes. And then the temporary school gets included, but it can only be used for infrastructure pursuant to 106. And I, on the subject too, to issue the I think the consultation with the chair has to be on the finalised form of the letter. The subject to an undertaking is for the officers to deal with. I'm not going to get involved in the fine. Okay, I think that's helpful. Well, we're going to have to. We will just read that back. if you can once you. If you can read it back and then we can vote on it. Okay. Recommendation to give delegated authority to the director of planning place to issue a letter in the form. In the uh, form in the, of the in, in the form. Shall I can I suggest something? Yes. Of the draft attached, subject to finalization and consultation with the chair, and then subject to I'll let you carry on. Subject to finalisation. No. Right. Subject to receipt yeah. of an undertaking given by HC801 Limited that the money referred to, sorry, that the funding referred to in the Eastern Quarry Limited letter of. 26 June 2024 is used for provision of structure pursuant to planning obligations, including provision of the advice. To be used solely the provision of infrastructure pursuant to planning obligations, including. Like that was perhaps point yes. isn't it? Yes. Yes. I think interest on the debt, etc. Right, we've got a resolution. 
recommendation. Recommendation. So, proposal for a resolution. So, we've got a recommendation. Um, those in favour? Yeah. So, that's unanimous. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for, thank you, uh, Peter, for your contribution. Mm -hmm. And thank you to everybody else. And thank you to Tim for having to draft in the committee meeting. Um, thank you. On to item seven, planning activity report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this is the usual reports um, for noting. Um, only this is a uh, report of one performance report. Um, you'll see here that the speed of decision making has exceeded uh, the targets. There haven't been any appeals during the reporting period. Um, I do just want to draw people's attention to 3.4 and 3.5. Uh, we're trying to provide some more um, consistent um, updates in terms of enforcement activity. I don't think that necessarily jumps out too much in the report, so we might just need to think about where the way in which that's presented um, in the future, but the enforcement um, area is um, is there. Um, I know that Michael and the team are trying to focus in on, on a collection of uh, major applications um, for some time, um, so we have got quite a busy committee uh, programme lined up for the next couple of months. I have to take any questions. If any questions? No. Well, thank you very much for that report, Mark. Thank you. Um, and now we're on to delegated items. Delegated items, yes. So covering um, May and June, so a couple of months, a uh, two-month year, two -year period, 17 items on the report, including a couple of withdrawn um, applications. Um, but yeah, this is again for noting perhaps to take any questions. Questions? No? Thank you, Mark, and thank you to you and to Michael, Simon, uh, for your contributions today. So thank you very much. Unless there's anything else. Can, can I just